Of course, our stories don't begin with us, which is why the book, The Story of Gaia, doesn't begin with the birth of Gaia four and a half billion years ago. Our stories go back as far as we can remember to our ancestors, potentially to our origins. And we now, thanks to the technologies that can see further out in space as ever, as never before, and smaller and larger scales than ever before, we can go back to the very beginning of our universe and tell the story of Gaia and our entire universe from that very first moment. I'm going to skip over this a little bit because I want to really focus today and the time we have today on the how, how what we're finding as the underpinning of the appearance of our universe plays itself through a whole evolutionary arc from simplicity to complexity. So what I'm sharing on this screen, I do appreciate I'm going to sort of run through, um, but I have presented in, in prior uh, times with our theosophical uh, American community, more detail on this. And I write about this in, in much more detail um, in my previous book, The Cosmic Hologram. But what we're finding now is that evidence at all scales, and I'm talking not just at quantum scales, I'm going way smaller than the quantum scales, to something that's named after Max Planck, one of the great pioneers uh, of the quantum age, and, and named after him the Planck scale. And the Planck scale is where the reality of our finite universe literally arises into being. Its appearance arises at that pixelated scale of the Planck scale, which is as small as to an atom as the atom is to an entire universe. But we're also, and this is vital, we're now realizing cosmologically that the appearance of our universe, its energy, matter, its space and time, is not only meaningfully informed, but holographically manifested. And what is really exciting is we now have evidence, discoveries over the last couple of years, three, four years, that this is absolutely the case. So we're not just saying this is an idea, this is a possibility. We're saying we have ever more compelling evidence that the appearance of our universe arises from deeper levels of meaningful, purposeful causation in the form of digital information, meaningful information, and holographically manifested. Now, the fractal signature, and fractals, I'm, I'm sure you, you probably, some of you at any rate are aware of what fractals are, but they're, they're patterns, they're relational patterns, they're essentially geometric. And again, you know, if we go back to um, ancient Greek geometers, they talked about, you know, God is a geometer. Everything in reality is geometric. And indeed it is. What we find, though, in, 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 in our, the appearance of our universe are not the mathematical idealized patterns of triangles and squares and an octahedra and an icosahedra and dodecahedra, tetrahedra, but they are fragmented patterns of those that are the very deeper scale do indeed go to those idealized patterns. But we find them as clouds. We find them as river systems. We find them at the scale of atoms. We find them at the scale of galaxies. We find them at all scales. And this fractal signature is indicative of this perception, this understanding of our universe being a cosmic hologram. And in 2017, a group of researchers looked out and they took a map of the whole of space. And that's the map you see on this slide. And the, the, the color differences are tiny, tiny temperature differences in different areas of, of the whole of space. The point is when those are analyzed, they are fractal in nature. So we're literally seeing at the whole of space, this, this signature that shows us we're on the right track that our universe indeed manifests as a cosmic hologram. And what this is actually is the relic 
radiation called the cosmic microwave background, which actually occurred about 400,000 years after the beginning of our universe when it cooled down enough to then be transparent to light. And these tiny temperature differences showed up that nearly 13.8 billion years later, we can measure and give us a deep, deep appreciation of the underlying reality of our universe. And in 2018, MIT scientists, Massachusetts Institute of Technology scientists, showed universal non-locality, which is something that has been perceived and written about from ancient times, such as in the Bhagavad Gita, such as in the Upanishads uh, of ancient India. The Ishnavaya teachings of ancient India essentially said that our entire, the whole of reality, exists as a unified whole. And moreover, mind and consciousness aren't what we have. They are literally what we and the entire nature of reality is. And that's what we're now rediscovering, not just as a theoretical underpinning and framing, but as an evidence-based realization that is now converging with universal wisdom teachings. And universal non-locality, which is actually a, a, a requirement for quantum physics to work at all, because what we call quantum energy matter, which is actually information expressed as quantized energy matter, is part of a universally non-locally unified universe. And we discovered this, well, we didn't discover this, over many years, this had been being evidenced at ever larger scales in the laboratory and, you know, ge geographically across many miles um, on Earth. But in 2018, scientists were able to show this non-locality by entangling laboratory photons of light with starlight from 600 light years away and light from a quasar, which is a very active galactic centre. 12.2 billion light years away. Now that's universal scales. That light left that quasar 12.2 billion years ago. So we now have ever more compelling evidence of what you know I'm sharing tonight and through many, many different thousands, tens of thousands of researchers. Now, all of this is, is, is sort of shared in the cosmic hologram, and also it's found on our whole world-view.org website with lots of resources, lots of videos, lots of articles. So I'm not going to go any more into that now. I'm going to move us on to this evolutionary impulse that's embodied in our entire mindful, conscious, living universe. So our universe began 13.8 billion years ago, not in the implied chaos of a big bang. It wasn't big, we know that, that was always a facetiousness, it was minute. But it was also not a bang in the sense of uh, an, an implied chaotic explosion. Instead, our universe began as the extremely fine-tuned, simplest and first moment of what I refer to as an ongoing big breath, whereas, whereas space has expanded ever since and time has flowed forward ever since, our universe has been ever able to not just exist as a unified entity, but to evolve from, from its initial simplicity to ever greater levels of complexity, individuated self-awareness, interdependence, de and interbeing. And of course, I know many of you will appreciate that the big breath is again redolent of this ancient understanding of our universe being the outbreath of Brahman, the outbreath of God, a great spirit. 
In addition, from that very first moment of space-time for the first 380,000 years, our universe, first of all, began in its incredibly hot state, and the space has expanded ever since. It's cooled down. So for the first 380,000 years, it was too hot for light, for, for visible light, for it to be transparent to light. But it was transparent to sound. So again, just as we're told in the, in the ancient teachings of the primordial Om singing our universe into reality, so indeed there was a primordial Om that lasted for 380,000 years. And biblical teachings too say in the beginning was the word. This was the primordial word, the intelligent, informed, guided, meaningful, purposeful word that began to sing a resonant and harmonic and profoundly and dynamic relational and unified universe into being and on its evolutionary journey ever since. And this initial primordial arm actually began to shepherd the very first energy and matter into what would become hundreds of millions of years later, stars and galaxies, and then interstellar dust clouds of dust and gas, where the harbingers, the basic prebiotic building blocks of us, were already starting to form even before our planetary system came into being. This is an epic story of evolution. 200 million years after or thereabouts, as far as we're aware of the earliest stars came into being about 200 million years after the start of our universe. And now with this wonderful new space telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope, the, the sort of the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope, and, and seeing in, in infrared uh, frequencies of light, more so than visible, we're able to, to see even further back than Hubble was able to, to the very earliest eras of our universe and the earliest stars and the earliest galaxies and the earliest black holes to form. But it was in those first that fir those first generations of stars that what's called nucleosynthesis, as stars heat up, become hot enough, you know, gravitationally collapse from the matter around, you know, that the, the, they're embedded in, collapse and then begin to shine. They're so hot, their centers and, and their, their innards are so hot that they're able to undertake this nucleosynthesis from hydrogen, the simplest of elements, and helium, to all 94 natural elements through this wondrous alchemical process of simplicity to complexity. And of course, all of those 94 natural elements have different chemical properties. They are there in the most incredible way to allow further complexity and diversity to ever, you know, to, to evolve, to emerge over aeons of time. But those stars, those very earliest stars, were huge, sometimes a thousand times as big as our sun. And because they were huge, there's a dynamic in, in stellar lifetimes that the bigger they are, the shorter they, their lives. So they 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 lived short lives, but when they died again, they didn't just, you know, die into quiet, into an ember. They exploded. And when they exploded, all of their abundance, the elemental abundance, was distributed, almost like a gift to the interstellar medium. And it's from generations of massive stars doing that that enable the next level of complexity the next emergent evolutionary step of our entire universe to progress. But part of the, the wonder of these earliest generation of stars, there were some of them that were the size that neither exploded nor died into quiet embers, but beca were, became black holes. 
And the earliest stars, the very massive stars, but subsequently large stars, when they collapse into what we call black holes, the earliest ones were so, they, they, because space was much smaller then, and it's been continuing to expand ever since, they were much closer together. So what we're now beginning to understand is that that earliest cohort of stars, some exploded out this wondrous natural abundance, but many formed what became supermassive black holes, which we're discovering are the centers of many, many galaxies. They almost hold what becomes galaxies of stars around them. So all of this is incredibly fine-tuned. You know, without this, we would not be here. Everything that I'm sharing now is key to us being here today and being able to be having a human experience on our planetary home and having this exploration, being able to look back and see this extraordinary journey of which we are. It, this is our heritage. This is our 13.8 billion year old heritage. So by the time that about 9 billion years had gone, you know, just like that, um, we are in a situation where our galaxies and many other galaxies, our galaxy we call the, the Milky Way, it's a spiral galaxy. Within it were a number of interstellar clouds of all of those natural elements, ice, because hydrogen and oxygen had come together by then to form ice, very cold in outer space. So not water, not liquid water, but ice and vast amounts of it. And complex molecular prebiotic building blocks of biological systems. This is a, this is an image from the latest James, well, one of the latest images from James Webb. And you can see the blue of the background, and then you can see the brown. And the brown is the, is the denser gas, gas and dust cloud, which are basically interstellar birthing clouds for planetary systems. Such as this cloud would be where our planetary system was born from around five to five and a half billion years ago. And with embedded stars already within it, their light bathed these clouds of elemental abundance and ice and prebiotic molecules. And around that time in us, in our galaxy, in such an interstellar dust cloud, there was again a stellar, a massive stellar explosion, a massive star at the end of its life underwent what, it called, what we call a supernova explosion. Not too close, but not too far, that its shock waves were able to sort of ripple into such a dust cloud and it collapsed as a result. Now, had that explosion been any bigger than it was or closer than it was, it would have just destroyed the cloud. If it was further away or smaller than it was, the cloud would not have collapsed into basically a protoplanetary disk, a proplid, such as our solar system. This is an artist's impression of what our planetary system would have looked like between five and five and a half billion years ago. And you can see orbits around what's beginning to form a central star, a central sun, that are in already harmonic orbits. The orbits of our solar system and most solar systems that we're finding now throughout our galaxy are in harmonically resonant orbits and therefore stable. So although the beginning of our solar system then went through quite a turbulent time, it began in this resonant way and it settled down again into long-term stable resonance, which is why we have been able to evolve on our planetary home. And our planetary home with our family of planets comprise, of course, our sun, 
And then Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, asteroids, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. And I still consider Pluto as a full planet, despite the fact that a number of years ago, the astronomical societies um, termed Pluto a dwarf planet and a, and a, and a, and a type of, of planets called Plutoids because we were finding just so many of them, especially further out in the solar system itself. But although the earlier epoch of our solar system, the outer planets we now understand weren't in the orbits they are now, but almost went a wandering around our solar system. Jupiter, it appeared, moved further in, but as he did so, he cleared a lot of that early debris, which enabled those inner planets, including Earth, to be in less danger of being destroyed. But as he moved in, if he'd continued to move in, we would have lost him as then a continuing protector of the inner solar system, which he remains to this day. Because, because of his resonant orbit with Saturn, Saturn also started to follow Jupiter into the solar system. But their planetary dynamics meant that Saturn moved a bit quicker, caught up with Jupiter, and then they both rebounded out to the orbits they are now. So Jupiter now continues to be the great protector because of his huge size of the inner solar system. And Saturn's orbit is very closely resonant with ours. So Saturn has been helping Earth, Gaia, to stay in a stable um, uh, orbit around our sun, around Sol, ever since. And also Uranus and Neptune had their own adventures before they settled down. And also, again, helped to clear the, the, the sort of solar system of the, the huge amount of leftover material when the planets uh, were, were born. So that's why we can now have a very stable solar system of, of sun and planetary retinue, which has enabled the ever greater emergence and evolution of complex life here on Earth. And to just say that with the amount of water or ice and especially ice that our entire solar system was formed from, not just Earth, Gaia, but also Mars and Venus probably began as water planets. And they were able to therefore nurture the continuing emergence of biological organisms, because those building blocks of biological life in the interstellar dust clouds, those conditions were too severe to go any further. So they needed planetary homes to be able to go on that next stage of the embodiment of the evolutionary impulse of our entire universe. And so Mars, Venus, Earth, and also some of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn were now finding we're now finding the likelihood of oceans, liquid water oceans beneath some of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. We're finding because of the Mars um, probes that there was probably a lot of water on Mars very early on and possibly the ability to begin biological life. Venus too. The problem that Mars had, he's too small and he's too far away from the sun. So he lost a lot of his atmosphere and, and actually had a, a significant impact event early on, which probably stripped his atmosphere pretty much, a little bit of atmosphere left, but probably you know, brought to a standstill the ability for his biological evolution to go any further. Venus, too hot, too, too, clear to the, too near to the sun, and became a, a, what's called a greenhouse planet, incredibly hot, but again, in the very early days, likely to be able to, to, to harbing, you know, be a harbinger for biological life. But here, here, on our beautiful planetary home, water was present in great multitudes. And our planet, too, was in the perfect place of the habitable zone, the Goldilocks zone, not too hot, not too cold, distant from our sun just right for that water to be liquid. 
and the right size and also to have the right um the the, the a, a, a strong magnetic field so there's too much to go into now but there are so many ways in which our earth is incredible as a planetary home for increasing complexity and that evolutionary impulse to continue and water is vital also is the fact that our sun sol our moon luna and gaia are a trinity system our moon is is larger than any other moon in our planetary system other than pluto's moon charon to its planet so gaia and luna are almost like a double system and therefore luna and was she was much much closer to gaia in those early days and being close again was a vital factor in gaia's own evolutionary impulse because at that time we know that our star our sun sol was about a third fainter than he is now and therefore the light that shone on gaia would have we would have been a, a frozen planet his light was not enough to keep liquid all the water that had formed when gaia formed because of all of that water in the interstellar dust cloud before us but it was luna who was much closer to us and therefore whose tides kept us warm essentially and kept the water liquid and gave gaia an opportunity to become a planetary mother for biological organisms the other thing that's really enabled gaia to continue to be this wonderful planetary mother is our orbit is not circular it's elliptic but that ellipse itself varies over long periods of time we're also tilted to our you know axis and that tilt itself varies over time we also wobble slightly on our axis and that wobble changes over time so these um these cycles called after a serbian research called milankovic actually have enabled complex life to continue to evolve on guy because what they do is they enable different environmental opportunities you know we have ice ages we have warm um, warm periods um we have seasons all of those are down to this variability over these long term cycles and gaia gaia is a completely interdependent planetary system the term gaia the name gaia comes from the ancient greeks and gaia is the name they gave to the earth goddess perceiving gaia as a sentient being which of course is what you know this emergent understanding also shares of a living sentient conscious universe and so planetary home and so you know they called our mother earth gaia and then a few decades ago a researcher called james lovelock and began to really understand the level of interdependence for the whole of gaia for the whole of earth you know the 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 the, the, the her geosphere her rocks and her minerals her atmosphere her waters her hydrosphere and of course her biosphere and he realized that they are interdependent and they undergo cycles so for example because gaia's crust crustal rocks are so shallow and beneath that we get ever greater heat as we go further down into her center the crust is is like is like broken up into a number of plates rather like if you have a creme brulee you know and the sugar the sugar coating on the top and you use your i love doing that and you and you use your fork and you crack it and it cracks into a number of areas well so does gaia's crust because it is so relatively thin and that enables these what's called tectonic plates to move over time on the underlying 
molten magma. And there's a whole process called subduction where they move across the surface of Gaia and they're subducted down. And what this drives are carbon cycles, volcanism cycles, changes in oxygen and, and carbon in the atmospheric cycles. Um, and therefore, again, churns up Gaia's surface in a way that is incredibly positive, in that, again, it allows variability and emergent complexity. But, you know, this understanding of tectonic plates a dear friend of mine is 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 a is a, a wonderful person called Dr. Kurt Johnson, and Kurt is an evolutionary biologist and much much more, but he was a researcher at a time where this theory, this theory as it was then, of tectonic plates was finding more and more evidence, but people were not agreeing it. They were absolutely saying no 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 this can't be right. And yet, because more and more evidence was accruing, this understanding that indeed Gaia cycles are greatly guided and driven by tectonic processes became to be the accepted understanding. We're now at a threshold where all I'm sharing today is at the leading edge of our understanding. And yet we have so much compelling evidence for it that even now mainstream cosmologists are coming out and saying in mainstream magazines such as New Scientist, we now understand that the space-time and, of course, energy and matter of our universe emerge from something deeper. As yet, they don't know what it is, but this is an absolute slippery slope to this recognition that indeed it is consciousness, that consciousness, mind and consciousness is the fundamental nature of reality. And this year, again, to see how fast this is moving, is that um, there were two physicists, Alan Aspect and Anton Zellinger, who won the Nobel Prize in physics for their research on quantum non-locality that I, I spoke to earlier in terms of it being universal. The point here, though, is that what I'm sharing isn't just a scientific revolution. It's a conscious revolution because it's actually showing us, it's helping us remember who we really are. And therefore, instead of an, a, the, the, the sort of hitherto prevalent paradigm of an essentially meaningless and purposeless, purposeless universe, where evolution is somehow driven by random occurrences and factors, where somehow consciousness comes out at the end and somehow arises, immaterial consciousness arises from material brains, is being completely turned upside down. So this is for all of us. This means something, I hope, for all of us, because we've had a worldview of separation that's driven a worldview based on that, behaviors based on that, which makes conflicts, inequalities a natural outcome. This is a whole worldview where the notion of separation is being shown to be illusory. Where we have now an understanding of a meaningful, purposeful, evolutionary living universe. This and the evidence, and crucially, the evidence. Because it seems to me that this can be a species change maker if we are willing to choose and wake up from this illusory perspective of materialism and separation. So I'll move on. So all of this then with Gaia's Gaia sphere, and just going back to James Lovelock, he, of course, you know, called his hypothesis of a completely independent planetary dynamics the Gaia hypothesis. But even James, and he passed over very recently at the age of 103, God bless him, um, 
wasn't quite ready to go, you know, to follow the the full evidence as we are now. But I think he would be excited by the way the evidence continues to to unfold and to reveal this this deeply meaningful understanding of a conscious universe. With this spiral continuing from simplicity to complexity. So let's just turn for a moment to the building blocks of biological life forms. Nine billion years in the making, from that initial hydrogen 13.8 billion years ago, to all of the 94 elements in stars, to interstellar dust clouds, to planetary homes, to us. And what we now have discovered within those interstellar dust clouds is all of the building blocks of biological life. We also now have the evidence that DNA, our genetic code, or DNA and the RNA, the messenger um, molecules, um, got it right first time. They weren't experimented with over billions of years. They were right from the first moment. They, they interlocked. They co-evolved, we now know, as innately informed, meaningfully guided ways of underpinning further emergence. We now know, and again, we've discovered these in, in these interstellar dust clouds, amino acids, which are the building blocks of pro proteins which when guided by the DNA template, but can be expressed in multiple ways. DNA isn't the master, the genetic master of biological organisms. It's the, it's the library, but it's also the servant of how an organism coexists and co-evolves with its environmental surroundings. But the amino acids are the fewest, and the optimum number to build proteins with a maximum variety. We've done a number of, a large number of analyses that show the informational underpinnings. It, you know, our universe gets it right pretty much first time. It builds complexity from simplicity. It uses the least energy to do so. And yet it does so in the most effective way. And to give an example of that, um, there are a whole group of um, molecules called enzymes, which are biological catalysts that help to speed up biological processes and reactions without changing themselves. Because without that speed, the whole emergence of complexity would just grind to a halt. So, we have these vast amount, uh, vast numbers of enzymes that partner with proteins to most effectively catalyze reactions. And an example, and probably the most extreme example, is one that is actually involved in the forerunner of DNA, and it's an enzyme called ODKase. And by lowering the energetic threshold for a reaction, it speeds up a precursor of the production of RNA from a time that would be literally millions of years to milliseconds. It literally speeds it up. So without it, as I say, the ongoing emergence of complexity would just ground to a halt. We also find lipids, oils that are absolutely vital for biological organisms and sugars that are our fuel all in interstellar dust clouds and ice, which on a planetary home such as Gaia, as liquid water, is vital. So we're more than stardust. The hydrogen in our bodies is as old as the universe. The water in our bodies, some of it is older there's been an estimate that more than half of the water in our bodies and Gaia's waters is older than our planetary system. This is our legacy. This is our heritage. Another fun thing. 
the DNA in every single one of our cells. Yeah? We have 37 trillion cells in each of our bodies. The DNA in each of our cells curls up, curls up. It's too small to be seen. And yet, if we pull it out, the double helix, and yank it out, it will stretch two meters long. With all our cells in a single human body, the DNA in each one of us reaches across the diameter of our entire solar system. With eight billion people living on Gaia, the DNA of all of us together reaches over 10 times the visible diameter of our entire Milky Way galaxy. And yet, our DNA all the time is being communicated with, and the genes that it encodes are being expressed in, in different ways, dependent on the needs of the organism. So it reconfig reconfigures in milliseconds. And unlike the cable in my computer or mobile phone or whatever, it never, ever gets tangled. So we've been told a story of random mutations, random processes to drive biological evolution. But as I say, the DNA is not merely read only. It's responsive with read-write capabilities to express genes in different ways. So it's not the master of our bio biological progress, our meaningfully informed, communicable, continuing dialogue, intelligent bodily forms. Evolution is not driven by random mutation. Every time a signal goes to sort of unlock the DNA by RNA to, to sort of take the instructions of what's needed in a particular circumstance. There's an error rate of about one in 10,000 times. But what the RNA in each and every cell of our bodies does is it actually then takes out, it has numerous mechanisms for reducing that error rate from one in 10,000 times to one in a billion times. If random mutations drove evolution, our universal evolutionary impulse would just let them run riot instead of doing all that it can to take them out because we know that they are not beneficial, almost never beneficial to a biological system. They happen, but very rarely and often and almost always even then they end up in, 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 in sort of endpoints of evolution. And all of this is not passive, but proactive and beneficially responsive, adaptive. We now know that there are other ways in which our biology, our lifestyles, our emotional, our mental well-being, our, our environmental circumstances cause what's called epigenetic changes within a single lifetime, which can then get passed through hereditary processes. But even more than this, in the time that our Gaia has been evolving, biological organisms throughout her whole Gaia sphere, her biosphere from simplicity to complexity, when circumstances have been pretty stable, as they have been for the last 11,000 years or so, biological evolution slows down literally to a snail's pace. So what Darwin was observing was actually snail's pace, minimal evolution. You know, the, the change in the beaks of, of birds because of their environment, but no big change. When we go back, through you know the time that we can access fossils and we go back through the Milankovitch cycles and beyond, we see that where there's a medium amount of change in the Gaia sphere, then there is more evolution. And there is evolution of species, but it's in a sort of mid-range. 
But there have been a number of times in Gaia's story where there have been cataclysmic breakdowns. And those breakdowns have occurred for a number of reasons, including 66 million years ago with the dinosaurs and the, the asteroid um, crashing into the, off the Yucatan Peninsula. But those absolutely huge changes have meant the end of a whole evolutionary arc to that point. But then what happens are whole mass processes of what's called horizontal gene transfer, where the whole of the biosphere, the whole of Gaia's intelligently guided biosphere doesn't go slowly, slowly through the sort of you know longevity of DNA transfer downwards. It goes across. Instead of vertical, it goes across horizontally by a whole raft of processes that also involve bacteria that also involve viruses as evolutionary change agents. And this is what's happened time and time again when we look back and we've seen cat you know, catastrophic changes, very rapid changes in, 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 in the environment, the geosphere. There's been a huge surge of biological emergence very, very quickly. And finally, you know, the whole of this evolutionary journey is one of co-evolutionary partnerships with organisms and ecosystems being a whole. And in a, not just a biosphere, but an entire gyosphere, where plants and photosynthesis is a major foundation of that ongoing journey of complexity to us. So to come close to the end of, of this presentation, I hope that by now, at the end of this very, very, very rapid journey, that is really what I share in the book, The Story of Gaia, to invite us to feel, to think, to experience, to embody ourselves as Gaians. And where Gaia's own continuing emergence is embodied in such co-evolutionary partnerships and where now our conscious evolution, our conscious revolution, our conscious we-volution can be integral to Gaia's own evolutionary progress and purpose. And what this is offering us is both an emergent and integral cosmology of a conscious and evolutionary universe, but as a basis for a unitive narrative for humanity to underpin and frame the choice we're invited to make to stay in the illusion of materialism and separation or to come together and accept the invitation of the universe and Gaia to consciously evolve. And to finish with a paraphrase of Théo de Chardin, who was a philosopher, some of you who, know, who may know, who at the end of the First World War wrote, someday we shall harness the energies of love, and then for a second time in the history of the world, humanity will have discovered fire. I would suggest that that someday is here and now. And as we wake up to the radical reality of a unitive narrative, we'll also discover as a species and perhaps for the first time, as a species, not as a culture, not as a small group of philosophers or mystics, but as a species and for the first time, who we really and truly are, and who we can evolve to become. 